Okay, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and thanks for joining us live at the dig. Now apologies if this is your second joining us live at the dig because we're here deep in the University of Aberdeen's Museum Collection Centre so the Wi-Fi signal maybe isn't penetrating through the granite where it's, it's in Marshall College, it's maybe not penetrating quite as well as it could so apologies if we dropped off before and hopefully that won't happen again. But thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Crowley, Public Engagement Officer here at the University of Aberdeen. Um, and this is really to kind of look at what's happening now that we've finished the King's Dig. If you visit the site of the dig, you'll see that the turfs have been reinstated. The finds have moved on, some of them are here, and ultimately, if the university successfully bids for them and gets these finds, this is where some of the finds will come and live for the rest, for, for the, the remainder of their life. Now, the dig itself was successful. We had two aims in it. One, to uncover the site of the grammar school, to understand as much as we could archaeologically about the grammar school and its environment, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But the other aim of the dig was to engage as many members of the public with history, heritage and archaeology as we could. That's the ethos that underlies the Scottish Government's 2017 sponsored year of history, heritage and archaeology, and that's why the Heritage Lottery Fund gave us money to undertake this project. And I think it would be fair to say that we've actually been very successful in the engagement part of it. Over the course of May Festival, some 2,050 people, members of the public, came along and joined us at the dig site. They came along to the wall where we had the finds laid out. They could review the finds of the day, chat to the archaeologists, see the work uncovering. In addition to those 2,000 odd people, we had over 400 school children. Well, not just school children, there was mostly school classes, but also young archaeologists. Um, as well as girl guides and scouts all joined us and they all had a chance to learn about the school and take part in some archaeology as well. They all trolled, they all did a little bit of sieving, they, they learned everything that it takes to be on an archaeological site. And in addition to that, of course, as you know, we've done Facebook Live. So far we've had nine broadcasts and we've had over 40,000 people viewing these broadcasts. So I think we can be fairly certain that this part of the project has been entirely successful. So joining us again today is Neil Curtis, Head of Museums here at the University of Aberdeen and here we've got some fantastic assemblages of material, some of which are our treasure trove himself, but that's enough from me. Neil, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, I mean, as I you know, said in a previous Facebook yeah. Live, um, all archaeological finds in Scotland are really the property of the Crown, which then decides which museum to allocate them to. So we have tend to get most of the prehistoric and early historic material from the, the northeast of Scotland, but also some material associated with the history of the university, which is what interests me with the, with the King's Dig material. So this is just a, a fraction of the, of the things we, we have from various excavations. Many of them are from developer-funded things, so we have uh, we've assembled them and excavated as a result of building wind farms, gas pipelines, roads and so on but also some that have been research projects like the King's Dig. I'm thinking here of the, the excavations at Crathis, which found a, a Neolithic hall, and we have the, the finds here from that site. So certainly if, you know, when the material comes up for allocation, um, I'll write an application to the Treasure Trove unit um, saying why it should come here. If we're successful, then it too will, will join here, where we then will look after it in case anybody in the future wants to study it further or we want to use it for public engagement activities or an exhibition or, or whatever. Um, but certainly this is a, a small fraction of the you know, tens of thousands of, of objects that we, we have in the, in the collection centre here at Marshall College. Okay, I mean, that's a really interesting point there, Neil, that you make, that, and perhaps not everyone's aware of it, that the majority of archaeological digs that happen in this country are developer-funded. Mm. They happen ahead of development. There's archaeologists who work in local authorities. They'll put conditions and planning applications. Of course, most major developers know this. They build this into the capacity of their projects. So most of what we know about Scottish archaeology is developer-funded and by its nature is urban. Yeah. Really? Yes. Yeah. And indeed, I was just noticing here we've uh, material that came from the building of the Sainsbury's in Nairn. Yeah, right. So yeah. there's very odd sites, and it yeah. does mean that we're over time building up a very rich picture of what's going on. But it is biased, yeah. and it just depends on a lot of different projects eventually mm. filling in the gaps. And that's what's been interesting about the King's Dig itself, because one of the things that we pointed out actually in the broadcast with Tony Robinson last week was that there has been very little modern development on the high street in Old Aberdeen is the historic campus. It's the historic heart of Old Aberdeen, the historic heart of the university. So no modern development, no modern developer funded archaeology. Yeah. So what we found out in this rescue, uh, rescue, sorry, research, <laughs> quite the opposite, the wrong word, research archaeology 
um, project at the King's Dig is really is, is opening up a new chapter, hopefully, in the history mm. of this area. What's also great about it is it's been the nexus of, on the one hand, public engagement, research archaeology, and also a lot of the students from the university's archaeology courses have been involved in the dig itself. So it's a, it's a combination or a nexus mm. of teaching, research, and public engagement. Yeah. So, I mean, it's great to see all these things yeah. coming together. Mm. Yeah. But we're talking about the finds. Um, shall we head upstairs and have a look at some of the finds that we've got here from the dig itself? And you'll remember our colleague, Dr. Gordon Noble, the senior lecturer in archaeology here at the University of Aberdeen. And he joins us again today, and he has started work on a selection of the finds. I mean, finds are one of the, the great successes from, from this, this project. We have had a huge number, hundreds, possibly thousands, Gordon? Thousands, I would say. Thousands, yeah. Okay. Finds of which this is a, a very small selection. So, Gordon, what do we have? Well, we do have a very small selection here. Uh, as I say, we've got thousands of finds. Literally, a whole wheelbarrow <laughs> load of finds came back. That is the on correct Sunday, technical term. Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> All organised very neatly, I must say. Um, but you know, really quite remarkable. We were expecting a decent uh, number of finds, really, because we are digging it on a historic mm. site uh, that's been occupied for hundreds of years. But it was really quite surprising the number and mm. diversity of finds we, mm. we got here um, through the King's Dig. So just to show you a selection of finds. So probably if we go back to some of the the older material. Um, which is just lurking in the box here somewhere. Um, one of the quite nice surprises really was some of the very, very old material that we got. Um, so we'll come on to some of the, the medieval material we, we got, but uh, we also had some prehistoric flints. Um, so these are going back thousands of years rather than just a few, few hundred. Um, so we have uh, flint pebbles, um, and flint is just a just a sharp um, stone, or it breaks very nicely to make uh, stone tools. Uh, and you can see there's there's flakes. Um, some of them have got little smaller flakes. You can maybe just make out. Um, so these are the raw materials that people are using to make uh, stone tools in the Paleolithic, Mesolithic. Um, and Neolithic and, and uh, early Bronze Ages. So Gordon, would these be cutting tools? Um, most of it is, is just waste, you know, from actually making tools. Oh, okay. um, but we've got one or two things that are probably bits of scrapers for scraping animal hides, that kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, these could be anything up to, say, 12,000 years old through to maybe uh, three or 4,000 years old. Uh, and this piece in particular is quite intriguing. Um, we've had one of our flint specialists just have a quick look at it, really. Um, and it's of a, uh, possibly, <laughs> again, we'll have to get this analysed in more detail, but it could be um, an upper Paleolithic find. So, again, going back, say, 14,000 years ago. So, some of the early settlers perhaps were represented by this material from the King's Dig. So, that was a real surprise. Yeah. You know, we're expecting historic material medieval material, mm. um, but to get uh, some of these prehistoric flints is really quite uh, exciting. So kind of skipping forward in time, uh, we have some uh, range of different materials. We've got pottery, uh, we've got some locally made pottery. Um, so this is probably 16th century. Um, so going back to the origins of uh, King's College and the university. Um, so university being constructed in the late 15th early 16th century so this is kind of material that's been made locally probably in old Aberdeen or, or somewhere close by um, and that was a part of the establishment of the university wasn't it yeah um, the, the Bishop Elphinstone also had the town of old Aberdeen created into a borough of barony so it could have its own trades and craftsmen which is you know remembered to this day in Wrights and Cooper's places mm -hmm. the, the, the little lane leading off the high street but yeah so that they would produce these very yep. things for consumption in the college exactly yeah. so, yeah. so that's great it's, it's a nice wonder, indication is it almost tempting to say that this was clay from Seton possibly well possibly yeah mm. I mean we'll come on to some yeah. of the later Seton mm. pottery later on but uh, you know it's a very nice indication of some of the more local trades in, in Scotland at this time period but we also have imported material 
and these don't look like much you know they look like little bits of broken pottery as they are uh, sort of thing you might find in your garden but actually again much older than the, we were perhaps expecting so this is uh, from um, very nice uh, very posh high status serving vessels uh, and these have been imported from the Rhineland uh, in the 14th century probably or early 15th century so these are actually earlier than the documented establishment of the university. So again, that's really kind of quite exciting and maybe helping us rewrite some of the history books about old Aberdeen, yeah. uh, the age of settlement there. Um, but again, you know, fr from the flints and light, you can see this was an area very attractive to settlement going back thousands of years. So, um, but it's nice to have this material in terms of, again, challenging some of our traditional yeah interpretations uh, I mean this, this sort of date there could be equivocal it could have been something that was brought over but was high status in someone's household exactly, yeah. once the exactly, college was founded yeah. but yeah. It, yeah that's right so you know in future years we're hoping to get yeah. further down in our yeah. trench see if we can find some actual in situ features yeah. that might tell us more about whether we do actually have settlements and activity prior to the establishment of King's College uh, in the 15th mm -hmm. and 16th centuries so that's nice, it's very high status material. We also have some pretty bog standard stuff, but again, quite illuminating in, tell in terms of telling you a bit more about people's lifestyles um, at the university from the 16th century through to probably the late 19th century, judging by the, the dating of the material. So we have things like uh, um, uh, animal bone, ribs and, and uh, jaws, uh, this is a, a cattle scapula, uh, so this is kind of um, shoulder blade of uh, of a cow. Um, and so this tells you a bit about their diet, but also again, it links back into crafts and trade as well. You can maybe just make out on the end of this bone, you have some little notches out, little discs that have been cut out from the bone. So could they have been cut out for games? Making or gaming counters perhaps, board something like that, yeah. so. Uh, we do have things like that. We've got this little uh, shaped stone here, um, which is perhaps a gaming counter, just made from a little shaley kind of mica uh, rich type material here. So evidence of gaming and leisure activities um, on the university campus. Not quite the Las Vegas of the North, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, and other gaming things as well. We have uh, clay marbles. Uh, which are great for playing games for, uh, by the school kids. And we have quite a nice one here, which Neil will maybe tell mm. us a little bit more about. Yes, it's lovely, a tiny wee thing, but it, it's, you can see quite a distinctive pattern that is made of um, two colours of clay that have been uh, worked together. Um, and this is typical of, the, of Seton Ware. Um, the Seton Pottery was just across the road, uh, the other side of King Street from King's College. Um, and we have a very large collection of Seton Ware pottery. I mean, Gordon's got a uh, rather nice, t you know, tea caddy. Um, <laughs> the Seton Pottery was in existence from the mid 19th, the mid 20th century, but latterly it really mainly made uh, flower pots. So these are sort of late 19th century, uh, very much the same style. And you can see that these ones have been glazed with a clear glaze, which really draws out the, the pattern. Um, I interested to know, I mean I said that one was a, a tea caddy, this one I don't really know what it is, I mean other people may know so I'd be very yeah. interested to find out. I mean, Answers on a postcard. Yeah. Is it a, a, yeah. a big marble or then Chris has an even larger one, um, so I don't know, it'd be, be interesting to find yeah. out. Um, I mean certainly I, one of the things I find interesting with this material is this is all from archaeological context, from a known place, everything that's been found has been collected. Um, a in lot many, of the many things. cases handily dated and yes. names, yes. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, not this. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, those are individual pieces. Mm. They're they're beautiful. They're complete. But we don't know their story. Mm -hmm. um, and with this material, we've got it all together. We're able to you know start looking at what was working with mm. what else. And you look at this as well and think it's rubbish. Yeah. And that's what's wonderful about it, is yeah. most people would not have bothered collecting this so carefully and bringing it into, <laughs> into a museum and studying it. And this is actually what we've often missed. So a, a lot of the museum collections that were put together in the 19th, early 20th century, they are the beautiful individual objects, mm -hmm. but not this assemblage. And yeah. that's what really is tremendous seeing this. Which tells you a lot more about mm. people's lives, isn't it? So there are some great little um, yes. stories, I think, behind some of this material. So. We had this, um, we showed you that um, this last week, 
thinking it was maybe a candlestick. Mm. Um, but we've just had it uh, looked at by uh, Jane Geddes in our art history department, and she has identified it as mm. the top of a parasol. Uh, and this is a parasol, a very fancy parasol, fr from the uh, Great Exhibition uh, of 1851. So very, again, high status mm. material. You can imagine uh, a very fine lady walking down um, the high street, perhaps, with her parasol. Uh, so again, really nice little stories we'll be able to paint from uh, this material. It's that lovely juxtaposition of, of complete fiction and archaeology. <laughs> it's a, a very fine line. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then lots of other material. Um, this is the Charles II coin that we, mm. uh, we, I say, one of our school school kids. Uh, Hanover Street this. School, I believe it was Hanover <coughs> Street School. Hanover Street School. Well done, Hanover, Hanover Street. Mind of a lifetime. Um, so you can maybe just make out there's a thistle on one side uh, and uh, the crown and um, initials uh, C, C, R. Uh, and a little two you might just be able to see there, so Charles II. Uh, it's a mid 17th century. Um, fantastic find yeah. by one, one of the school kids. Um, and then other, other material, I've uh, got <laughs> literally bucket loads of these. Um, clay pipes, so smoking habits, so first introduced to the old world in the, in the 16th century and used throughout uh, into the 19th century. Um, some of these are, are finely decorated um, and we'll be able to analyse these and at least get some dates on them. So the, the older ones tend to be uh, the ones with a very small diameter bore because you know when tobacco was first introduced it was very expensive so you wanted to savour it as much as you possibly could. Whereas through time, uh, the central bores become larger, the pipes become more ostentatious, um, people are showing off through this terrible habit, isn't it? <laughs> so we shouldn't encourage that, but <laughs> um, again, great insights mm. into people's uh, lives uh, over the hundreds of years um, at uh, the university. And then a few other final things to show you, a few dress accessories, um, things like uh, little uh, copper alloy or bronze buttons from people's clothing yeah, other more kind of de decorative mites here um, so again it's really nice in terms of beginning to uh, piece together some of the, the fashions tastes uh, and activities that some of these objects re represent and then one final object again fairly mundane but I think ties us back into yeah. our uh, aims of the project to find the grammar school. So again we've got dozens and dozens of these um, slate pencils. So for drawing on slate boards, writing, doing grammar, arithmetic, that kind of thing. Um, so a really nice insight into um, what we were aiming to find, you know, the grammar school activities being conducted there. So really all ties it in quite nicely. So if I may jump in Gordon, yep. thanks very much for talking us through the finds but you're right, you tie us back into the grammar school at the end of it and that relates more to the features that we found in the ground. Mm -hmm. Are we confident that we found the grammar <laughs> school? Y yes and no, yes, so we definitely have what looks like one phase of the grammar school. So we've got this um, uh, north side wall with paving just outside, uh, nice granite uh, uh, um, cobbles. Uh, and a lovely threshold leading into the building and a return wall heading towards King's College. Uh, and we think the other side of the building had been removed by our great find of the first few days, the which Victorian. was the wa Victorian yeah. water pipe, which seems yeah. to have you know, gone right through the other side of the building. So we definitely have yeah. one phase of what very much looks like to be uh, the grammar school. You're right actually I probably quite naively at the start of this project entered into it thinking of the grammar school as one building yeah. but the grammar school was there for several hundred years and mm -hmm. it grew as the university grew. It, the number of boys attending it would have reflected the size of the university and the university grew exponentially in that period so it would have been redeveloped itself. That's yeah. right uh, and down below some of that uh, later phases we definitely have earlier walls 
uh, pits full of animal bone, all sorts of really interesting material. Um, but as always, there's more mm. questions than answers in some ways, so we really need to return yeah. with our students, get them involved again. So that's been a great element of the project is all the kind of involvement from our students, um, teaching on campus, hands-on research-led teaching. Um, so, you know, we've got lots of courses here at the university. If people are interested in getting involved in, in doing archaeology, studying archaeology. Um, so we've got undergraduate courses in, in archaeology, BSc and MA. We've got master's programs in archaeology of the north, archaeology, museum studies. Um, and from next year, we're going to have an osteoarchaeology uh, course, which is going to be all about studying human bones, human remains. Uh, using the very mm. rich collections we have here yes. um, at Aberdeen. It's happened been very exciting recently seeing this increasing use of the collections by students. So as you say, we're looking at the, the medieval bone collection and prehistoric bones as well that we have. Mm. Uh, and as we speak, we've got the Museum Studies Master students uh, are in the last stages of preparing the exhibition, which will open in a couple of weeks' time in King's Museum on the Scottish Warrior. So they've been down in the store here looking for, for finding the things that are relevant to their story. So that'll be interesting to see in a couple of weeks' time quite what they've made of it. So yeah, that's great. Mm. And then one final course plug. Um, <laughs> we just launched a certificate in archaeology. Mm -hmm. so it's a two-year part-time course, uh, which you can uh, take online or you can actually come onto campus and uh, study alongside our, our other students. Uh, so if you're interested in these kind of projects, getting involved, lots of opportunities for, yeah. for doing so. As Gordon says, there's a great range of courses mm. available and there's, there's a lot of flexibility built into that as well. So ultimately, I think it's been a great project mm. to work on. I think a lot of people have got a lot out of it, um, including in our case, a lot of questions to be yeah. answered. And of course, what we've shown is that with these courses and the increased use of collections is the dig or even the deposition of an object into a museum is only one mm -hmm. small stage in that object's much longer life, so that hence the importance of, of keeping the museum collections in, in good order because people keep coming back to them. And thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen, then, for joining us. Um, Neil, Gordon and myself today at this last Live at the Dig. So thanks very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>